أحمد بن سلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ونعم محمد وعلى آل سيدنا على سيدنا ونعم محمد وبارك سلم سلم عليه سلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله You know, last week we were talking about Uthman, radiallahu anhu. Uh, and of course this is the month of Zil Hajj. Today is the 20th of Zil Hajj. Uh, as we know, he was martyred on the 18th. Uh, we also mentioned Umar, radiallahu anhu, who was also martyred in this month. Uh, and when we look at Uthman, as we mentioned a few things. You know, even though he physically was not in Badr, Rasulullah counted him as among the, the companions of Badr. So even though from an apparent standpoint he's not there, but the reality is because the Rasulullah said so, he is there. From an apparent standpoint, you know, those who are martyred, you, know, you look at them, heads cut off, bodies, you know, blown to bits. So apparently they are dead. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He says what? He says, Bal ahya, they are alive. So the reality is they are alive. Because Allah said so. And so the same way Rasulullah has the authority, even though someone may not be physically present somewhere, to say, no, he is present. And when we talk about the companions of Rasulullah, and as last week we spoke about Uthman, you know, most of us when we're listening and when we're talking, we're in awe of, you know, of Uthman radiallahu Unfortunately, many of us forget you know, the artist who designed Uthman. And here I'm referring to Rasulullah. So, you know, when you're, you know, if you, if you see a good connoisseur of art, you know, he looks at somebody's piece of art, somebody's artwork, the average person, he just sees that piece of artwork. But someone who's really a good connoisseur of art, he doesn't simply see that piece of artwork. But he sees the greatness of the artist behind the artwork. Rasulullah he didn't come to build infrastructure. His purpose for coming was not to build buildings. In fact, these are things that he criticized which are the things that we are doing today. You know, if you look at the Hadith of Jibreel, which famous Hadith where Jibreel al Islam comes, no one recognizes who he is, he comes and he sits before Rasulullah Sallallahu with his knees touching the knees of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he asks him several questions. We'll probably come back to, to, to those things, but the point I want to make here is in the end he asks him, he says, when is the hour? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says what? He says that the one being questioned knows as well as the one questioning. There are people who take this statement and they say, ah, oh, see, Rasulullah sallallahu didn't know. Well, 
which is very interesting because these same people will tell you that you know if you see see someone then you should you should expect good from them. You know you should have a husne dhan. You should you should uh, think good of them. And yet when it comes to Rasulullah so when they have a statement that they can take either way, they pick the they pick the negative sense of it. Rasulullah so didn't say I don't know. He said, the one being questioned knows as well as the one questioning. So they take it to infer that, oh, neither Jibreel or Rasulullah SAW knew. But those who understand, and those who have the aqidah of the companions of Rasulullah SAW, because they would ask him when the hour was, they wouldn't ask him if they thought he didn't know. Their understanding is that both of them know. And the other aspect of that statement is that Rasulullah Sallallahu is telling them, or telling Jibreel Islam, you know as well as I know that I can't tell them. This is not something Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has permitted for the mass to, for the masses to know. But when he t says this statement afterwards, he may, he says that I'll give you some of the signs, or Jibreel Islam says, well, then give us the signs. And he gave two signs in that narration. One was that the slave girl will give birth to her master, which is what we're seeing today. Children treating their parents like they're like, you know, they rule them or they own them. But the other sign, he said, what? That the barefooted. ignorant Bedouin will, will compete in building lofty buildings. And you look throughout the Middle East, what's going on? One country makes a, the, the tallest building in the world and now the next country has to beat that. Billions of dollars on one building. Which is also interesting when it comes to Molid, you know, they say, oh, you could have spent this on the poor. But when it comes to building all these high rises that have no purpose other than for show, then, oh, no one remembers the poor then. In fact, they use the poor as slave labor to build those buildings. The tallest clock that tower in the world, where? In Mecca. Built by those Bedouins. who have no connection to Rasulullah So Rasulullah he didn't come to build these lofty buildings. He came to build men. And men here not in the sense of male and female, but men in the sense of, you know, like, like they say, be a man, stand for something, have some character, have a spine. So when we look at Uthman, we see a man. Who is willing to give his life. But not to go against what Rasulullah wanted. So again, when we look at Uthman, uh, we remember Rasulullah And when we see Rasulullah we of course remember his creator and master, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when we look at Uthman, we see the authority of Rasulullah So even though he's not physically in Badr, Rasulullah says what? that he is among the, those who are, who are of Badr. Who can say this other than the one who was given the authority to say this? And not only did he, this it wasn't simply a statement that, oh yeah, okay, he's from, he's from the companions of Badr. He's also included in the spoils of war of Badr. 
and all the rights of Badr. Even later on during the time of Umar, when, when he would distribute the spoils of war according to the status of the person. So the Badri Sahabi, they were given a different portion. Those from Uhud were a different portion. Those from Hudaybi a different portion. The wives a different portion. So Uthman Radin was always included though, was included amongst those from Badr. Again, how? The, the, the authority of Rasulullah. Sallallahu We spoke about Bira Ruma, the well of Ruma, for whom Rasulullah had said, for which Rasulullah said that anyone buys this for the Muslims, for the believers, then I guarantee him Jannah. And then we spoke about what he did at Tabuk, 300 camels with all of, you know, the belongings on them plus a thousand dinar and so much more that he gave. After which the Rasulullah said that nothing Uthman does after this can ruin anything of his. Who can say that again other than the one who has authority? The statement that Uthman bought Jannah from Rasulullah twice, Bire Ruma, and Tabuk. If someone challenges, oh, Rasulullah SAW didn't say this, then it is very clear, however, that the companions of Rasulullah SAW said this, that Uthman bought Jannah from Rasulullah SAW twice. If you don't own something, how can you sell it? You know, you go to buy a house, you know, when they do all the document checks, they make sure that the person who's selling it is truly the owner of that thing, of that house. Then they take the signature and everything, and then they sell the house. They do all the investigation beforehand. You know, if somebody sells you something that doesn't belong to him, what do we say? Oh, it's hot. If you buy a hot car means the guy that sold it to you wasn't the legal, own, legal owner, and even though you bought it from him, because he wasn't legal, you're not legal. So this tells us what? That the companions of Rasulullah understood that the owner of Jannah is Rasulullah Otherwise, he doesn't have the authority to sell it. You know, like Allah SWT says, Inna a'atayna kal kawthar. Without a doubt, indeed, truly, O oh my beloved, I have given you, I have made you the owner of kawthar, of abundance. Not just the, the, the hawd on the Day of Judgment, on the pool, that everyone will want to drink from, but abundance of everything. I've given, I've given this to you. You are the owner of it now. You know, it's one thing I give something to someone on a loan, which means I still have authority over it. It's something totally different when I give it to somebody with the, with, and, and along with giving that thing, give them the authority to do whatever they wish with it. So again, you know, when we look at the companions of Rasulullah and we, we are in awe of their positions and status, it should remind us of the authority of Rasulullah <laughs> Even the statement of Rasulullah where he says that none of my companions will enter the fire. This doesn't mean that none of them made any mistakes. 
because they, they, they made mistakes. But even with those mistakes and with those shortcomings, none of them will be touched by the fire. Again, this is the authority of Rasulullah. Some of us. You know, if the, all of them were pious and didn't make any mistake, well, they're fine, they're going to paradise. But this again emphasizes the authority of Rasulullah. So, so. That he's given this to them, even with their shortcomings. Like, I, like we mentioned last week when a Rasulullah he said for Uthman Radion that it doesn't matter what he does after this, nothing of his can ruin anything of his. Then who are we to criticize him? And a Rasulullah is making these statements with the knowledge of what is to come later on. You know, because there are those who say, oh, you see Abu Bakr and Omar, they changed afterwards. Which is not true. But even if it had been true, Rasulullah would have known that they were changing afterwards. I mean, you know, if I look at the attitude and the character and the love between Abu Bakr and Omar, these two and Sayyidina Ali Karamallah Waj. You know, when when <coughs> Omar Radion he leaves for for uh, Sham, you know, because the people of Jerusalem they said, Oh, you know, we won't hand the key over to anyone except to the leader of the Muslims. And they describe him. So they know who he is. Because it was told in their books. When Umar Radha leaves for Jerusalem, he leaves Ali Radha in charge of Medina Munawar. And in reality, in charge of the whole empire. Because Umar Radha, he left with, he didn't leave with an entourage himself and his slave. And that was it, the two of them. No bodyguards, nothing. So if Ali Radha had felt like he had been cheated out of something, this was prime time to lead a coup. You know, look at the Muslim world today. Every place there's a coup. And back then, coups were even easier than they are today. When he says, when the Rasulullah says about his companions that they are like stars, that if you follow any one of them, then you will be rightly guided. And people say, oh, well, what about the mistakes that they made? The following is in their repentance, in their tawbah. Again, they are lessons for us. You know, the stars guide you. At least they used to. Of course, these days, no one knows. You know, you put it in GPS and, you know, auntie or whoever is talking in there, you know, she, she tells you where to go. You know, turn right, turn left, whatever else. And if she tells you the wrong thing, then people end up, you know, places they shouldn't be. Because they have so much trust in the GPS. Even though GPS can be wrong. What Rasulullah has taught us can never be wrong. In the old days, the GPS was the stars especially at night. If you're traveling, then 
you knew which direction you were going by the stars. So the stars also told you which way not to go. So when we look at the lives of the companions of Rasulullah, whenever there is a shortcoming, you always see the tawbah, the repentance. That if you slip and you move this direction, then this is how you correct yourself. Again, if you truly follow them, then you end up in the right path. Of course, you know, he says for his companions, for the Sahaba al-Qur'an, that they are like stars. He says for his Ahl al-Bayt, for the household, that they are the Safina al nuh the Ark of Nuh alayhi salam. That whoever gets on, on board is saved and whoever uh, abandons it is destroyed. And this is why we as Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we don't pick and choose. You know, when you're in the boat and you want to navigate, you use the stars. But in order to use the stars, you have to be in the boat first. So if somebody, you know, says, oh, I'm going to use the stars, but I'm going to ignore the boat, He's going to drown. And if somebody says, I, well, no, I'm going to ignore the stars. I'm just going to get on the boat. Who knows where he's going to end up? when we look at all of these things you know again Islam is, is, is balance you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything in balance he created the whole world in balance you know the imbalance that we see today is because of what we ourselves have done See this climate change and all of these things happening. I mean, that's not that's not because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created a system for that to happen. He has given us free will, and we have chosen to make this happen. So we have no one to blame but ourselves. Even what's going on right now. This is because of what we ourselves have set forth. And the only way to protect ourselves from it is to go back to Allah. But there is no way back to Allah except through Rasulullah. Uh, is everybody, oh, you know, go back to Allah, make us the far. Say, oh Allah, forgive us. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also taught us a methodology of doing things. Cool. Like even for salat. You know, somebody says, oh, I'm going to make, you know, salat. Well, there's a methodology to doing that. If I don't follow the methodology, then that salat is not accepted. Part of the obligatory part of Salat is Salatu Salam and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You can't complete your Salat with that without Tashahud. And within Tashahud, what do we say? As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And those who know Arabic, you know, they know that ayyu is only for those who are present. Ya can be for barib or ba'id, for someone who's cl close or far away. Ayyo you know? is only for the one who is present and close. So ayyuhan nabiyo, which means I'm acknowledging 
that Rasulullah Sallallahu is close to me and he is hearing me. Which is also why Ghazali in Ahir al you know, he mentions that when you say this, then you should understand and have firm belief that Rasulullah Sallallahu is listening to you and responding to your salam with something better. that connects to a lot of other verses of the Quran and narrations of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But coming back to what I started before I diverged. And you know, again, this is Zil Hajj, the martyrdom of Uthman, that we spoke about last week. And we alluded to the martyrdom of Umar Radiallahu as well. And when we look at Omar, you know, Rasulullah as we said, he said that there is a door that keeps the fitna out. And when that door will be broken, then the fitna will start to come. And of course that door, when Omar Radiyan was martyred, the companions, they understood who that door was. Ali Radiyan had already told them who the door was. Even before, when Omar Radiyan wanted to go and fight in, Iraq, and he said that if you go and something happens to you, then who will who will who will uphold the religion? Who will handle the religion the way it should be handled? So we see what happened afterwards. All of these fitnas started to come, and they are continuing to increase, and will continue to increase. Until Imam Mahdi salam return or not doesn't return when he comes and Isa salam returns. But the purpose of understanding anything in this world is really to make our connection with Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The purpose of knowing the companions of Rasulullah is again to make ourselves closer to Rasulullah. And since we've chosen to ignore this, we have chosen, you know, if you look at the Ummah, we have chosen to ignore this. then we see what happens as a result of that. There's a dua which I'll mention again later. Alhamdulillah alladhi a'fani mimma abtalaqbi wa faddalani ala kathirin mimman khalaqa tafdeela. in which Rasulullah Sallallahu says that if you see someone with an illness or difficulty, then you recite this. And Allah Subhanahu will protect you from that. But everything in Islam, whether it's Salat, Zakat, the obligations, the optional things, everything in Islam has no weight or merit or meaning unless the person performing that has made his connection with Rasulullah the way it should be connected or he should be connected. Which is also why he told his companions that there will be people who will come who will make salat and you will see your, your, your deeds, in, in, in short, your deeds will be, be insignificant to what they do. But nothing they do has any meaning. Because there is no connection with the Rasulullah And the only way to connect to the Rasulullah is to connect to the household of Rasulullah And the only way to connect to the household is to also have a connection with the Sahaba, with the companions of Rasulullah. So I'll end here today, inshallah. Uh, we'll 
as we, you know, since next month, as I said, today is the 20th of Zil Hajj, Muharram is coming. So we'll start talking about uh, the household of Rasulullah and specifically about Imam Hussein al Islam, inshallah. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fill our hearts with his true love and the true love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, his companions, and all those who they love, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah go with me, inshallah.